to your attention to Ephesians chapter 1. It's good to see everyone was able to make it out this morning. And, um, pray for my wife. She's not feeling well today. Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, today we'll look at uh, verses 8 and 9. It says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. I'm going to focus my attention this morning, Lord willing, your attention as well, on the phrase, <clears throat> made known unto us the mystery of his will. Leah wasn't able to come this morning, but if she was, it would all make sense because the other day she said, what are you preaching on, on Sunday? And I said, it's a mystery. And I laughed and I said, come and find out. And then she wasn't able to come. So I don't have to tell her about it or have her listen to the recording later. It was a mystery to her, still is, this morning, because she's not here, but it will be revealed, you see. And that's important to remember as we kind of look at this this morning. When something's a mystery, we think of it, or tend to think of it, as something that's beyond our understanding. And that's the reason why some folks reject the faith. Some folks totally flat out reject the message of, of the cross. Some folks flat out reject the message of Jesus Christ because they don't understand it. It's a mystery to them. Indeed, it was a mystery to us before we were saved. <clears throat> None of it makes sense, sense to the human mind not the virgin birth. The death of Christ doesn't make sense. <coughs> His resurrection. The new birth. Baptism. Church attendance. The rapture. None of this. None of this. A, a good bit of what we read here in the Scriptures can't be explained through human reasoning. And so, it's a mystery to this world. But we must understand that when the Bible speaks of mysteries, it doesn't mean that our religion, the truth of what we preach, the things that we believe, it's not a mystery in the same sense as other religions. If you go over to Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17 and verses 3 through 5, we'll begin with verse 1 and go down to verse 5. Revelation 17, beginning verse 1, And there came out of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and there came one of the seven angels, I should say, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth 
have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. <clears throat> now I believe in taking scripture literally, literally except for in those cases where it's obvious not literal. And while I'm certain that there have been some very large whores in this world, I don't believe that this is literal whore here that sits upon many waters. And as we read through this, I believe he's talking about none other than Catholicism in this passage. That great mysterious religion, it traces itself back all the way to Babylonian religion. And when we look at this world and all of its systems of religions, we know that there are many which are very, very old. And there are many who have... <clears throat> who can claim, some of them can even claim to be very ancient. And many of them claim to be very mysterious. There's Catholicism, there's the Eastern religions, there's Freemasonry and all of those sorts of things. But they're not the same as Christianity. We can't lump them in the same as what Christianity is. It's not biblical Christianity. Ours is not a mysterious religion like that. Because in those mysterious religions, the, the mysteries are locked up where only a certain few can understand them, or so they tell us that. And even today, certain cults operate in the name of, in, in, in the name of, of Christianity. And yet they're very mysterious. The book of Revelation itself means revealed, but sometimes preachers will try to make it into apocrypha, meaning hidden. But the Bible's not like that. Our, ours is not a, a hidden or mysterious religion. We cannot be like that. In fact, our very commission tells us to go out into the world and preach the gospel. And guess what? You go out and tell people the truth of the gospel, you're, you're not, you're not going to be hid or mysterious very long. People know who you are. People know what you're about very, very quickly. I suppose that <clears throat> if, if we wanted to be mysterious in the way that most folks think of mysteries, we could try to hide things, but we have nothing to hide. The gospel is to be preached clearly and plainly to the world. The building that we meet in is well known to be a church building. In fact, if somebody were to make a wrong turn and turn down this road, they could easily tell just by looking that this isn't just a house on the street in a residential neighborhood, that this is a church building. Now, it may not look like other church buildings, but it is a church building. And even if the sign were torn down and all that, they would be able to tell this must be a church building. The church where I used to pastor, we also met in a residential area. And the same thing. And we had nothing to hide. Your witness. It's a public witness. Somewhere along the way, 
in this country, people have gotten the idea that you can talk about anything that you want to out in the public square except for politics and religion, right? <coughs> Keep all of that quiet. Keep it to yourself. Well, whether or not you want to talk about your politics, that's up to you. But I'm telling you today that God's Word has something to say about our witness Go with me into the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication and spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The example that we've been given is that we as God's people ought to open our mouths boldly. And not only that, but we ought to seek and ask for prayers of others and we ought to be praying for one another that we may have the courage to be bold. To be bold in this world that we live in. Think about where we would be today if our ancestors, those who have come before us, spiritually speaking, if they would have stayed quiet. If they would have kept their heads low and stayed quiet. If the missionaries would have stayed home, where would we be today? I love to study history of this country and particularly Baptist history. The other day, Jimmy Sanchez asked me a question about the separatist Baptists, whether or not they were our kind of Baptists. Now keep in mind as you study history, Baptists were known by many names, just like Baptists are known by many names today. And so even us, we're known by many names. Some folks will call us landmark Baptists. Some folks will call us missionary Baptists. Some will call us independent Baptists. And they're all correct. But he asked if these separatist Baptists were Baptists like us. And I told him that among them, yes, there were some who were like us, who were exactly like us. Just like today. If you look up landmark Baptists, you'll find many who are just like us. You'll find some who aren't. But you'll find many who are just like us. Well, uh, he was reading something about North Carolina history. And so I was kind of telling him the things that I could remember from my own studies. There was a fellow up there by the name of Shubal Stearns. Some of y'all may have read about him in your own studies. He's known for his work up in North Carolina in the 1700s. In the wilderness of North Carolina, he went about planting churches and, I mean, doing the work of the Lord. Great Baptist up there. Well, down here there was a fellow by the name of Daniel Marshall. Daniel Marshall did the same thing in the 1700s. Um, of course, uh, he was a little bit before Mercer. Not much, but just a little bit. But um, they all tied together. But one thing that uh, intrigued me a lot was I found out that, uh, that Shubal Stearns and Daniel Marshall were brother-in-laws. I never knew that. But, uh, but, they, but Daniel Marshall had come from North Carolina, South Carolina, and then drifted on down to Georgia. I thank God for men like that. I think God, I mean, it's exciting to read the history and 
to tie it all together. But I thank God that men were willing to do things like that in the wilderness. Amen. You know, I, and, and, and sometimes I, we think about them yellow flies and those gnats and all that sort of thing and how they, how they aggravate. And I can't imagine what it must have been like when, the, when it was all wilderness and swamp down here. Praise God. They weren't willing to sit still and be quiet, but they, they, they kept moving and kept doing for the Lord. So what in the world is he talking about this mystery? Why does he call it a mystery? You know, Jesus spoke of it like this in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 and Verses 10 through 17, he said this. Well, the Bible tells here, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. So when the scripture is talking about mysteries, he's not meaning something that is totally completely hidden away or something that is incomprehensible to the human mind but rather something that is undiscoverable by the unaided human mind you see in other words you can't figure it out on your own I can't figure it out on my own and I haven't. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible speaks of it this way. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, In my speech... And my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You see, there it is. Now, look what he says here. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 
who God hath revealed, key word here, revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, or which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of God, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. You see, these things cannot be understood. They're, rather, they can be understood, but not in the flesh, until the mystery is revealed through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what, that's what Jesus is talking about. This is what Paul is talking about whenever he says that all this is foolishness to the wise. He's talking about the wise of this world. The philosophers couldn't figure out it was a mystery to them. The, 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 the great thinkers of the world, they couldn't figure it out. Only until, only until the Spirit did a work within them. Over in Matthew chapter 11, once again, notice what it says here. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Jesus said, these things are hidden. Hidden. From the wise and the prudent. What's he talking about? He's talking about those who are wise in their own eyes, those who are wise according to wisdom of this world. These things are hidden from them, but it's been revealed to babes, revealed to those who would seem as nothing. Uh, in fact, uh, when uh, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth there in 1 Corinthians 1, he said in verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, Things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Think about it for a moment. When Jesus came and he began to set up his church upon the earth, where did he go to call people? He didn't go to, to the great educational facilities. He didn't go to the, to the religious institutions of the world. He went started calling fishermen. Right? And he called some people that the rest of the religious world would have scoffed at. So what in the world's he doing? With that group of misfits. It's to the world, that's what they seemed like. Those apostles that he ended up with. That core group there. <clears throat> and he said, he told them, to go out to the world. You see, had he gone and called the wise, the mighty, the noble, 
Any success that would have come out of that, guess where the boasting would have gone? Guess where the guess, guess where the the everybody would have looked back and said, look at how great these guys were. No. The greatness was on Jesus Christ. The greatness was on the, the power of the Holy Spirit plan of the Father. The truth is truly hidden from the worldly wise men, but it's revealed to babes. It's a mystery until it's revealed. He reveals it not based upon man's merit. There's no boasting. Over in Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, verse 25 to 26. It says this, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Kept secret, but now is made manifest. And as we get back into our text there, as we kind of begin to bring this to a close, he says there in Ephesians chapter 1, having made known unto us, verse 9, the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. See there? Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Why? According to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. It's all of God. All of it. So when we think about this and consider it, are you saved today? A member of His church. Do you know the Father's will as it's revealed in His Word? Do you understand how this world is going to, to end? I'm telling you, I was thinking about that this week. There's so many people that are floundering around in this world. Not a clue as to what's going to happen. We know. We've got His Word and it's been revealed to us. We understand it. But we have no room for boasting, do we? Not any of it. Praise God for His grace. Even in the revelation having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. May God add a blessing to His word.